Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial. Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is 9.15. This is Storytime, brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our safe travels. We are grateful for our many blessings, the first of which was we woke up this morning. Father, we ask that you be with those that are listening today. Touch them and bless them in a special way. Father, we ask you to open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes as we bring forth today's story. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Duh, Brother D, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do today? Calm down, dog. You already know we're going to be doing chapter 12 of Spotted Boy and the Comanches, Battle with the Rangers. Duh, yeah, oh man, I, I just can't wait for Pastor Brian uh, so we can get on with the story. <laughs> just calm down, dog. First, we're going to do a little story called Thunders and Lightnings. Duh, uh, what, 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 what do you mean? Well, I want you to think about something. What a morning that must have been when the power of God moved to the mountaintop, thereby creating an awesome meteorological display. Duh, when was this, Brother D? Uh, Dog, I'm talking about when God came to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. Duh, uh, well, I remember when we drove through that thunderhead in in West Virginia across that long bridge, and that was scary. Yes, it was, dog, but... Just think about this as we go on. Mighty flashes of lightning, great roars of thunder would have been the natural response to the heated in the cloud meeting with the cool air at the top of the mountain. Now, in order for lightning to occur naturally, a massive cloud formation called a thunderhead has to form. Now, a thunderhead builds when warm air from the earth's surface rises. That's why some of the fiercest lightning storms form over desert areas with their hot rocks and soil. As the hot air rises, it cools. If the air is moist, as it it is if it results from a breeze blowing in from the sea, water condenses, freezes, and begins to fall as ice crystals that may grow into hail. The hotter the air below, the faster the air rises, often pushing the ice formations back up into the clouds so that they collide with those falling from above. Now, the collisions in the center of the thundercloud are so powerful that they shear electrons from otherwise stable atoms. Now, the electrons begin to collect as masses of negative energy charges. Oh, man, a negative electrical charge. Uh Uh-oh. That's right, dog. And when enough of them collect in one place, they are attracted to another part of the cloud or to the ground as a flow of electrons or electricity that appears to us as lightning. Now, you can imagine the awesome display and how awesome it was that morning in the camp of Israel when God made himself known to the people. Now, the children of Israel had not yet learned about the love of God. They saw only his power, and they were afraid. Now, when you see lightning and you hear thunder, what thoughts about God come to your mind? Are you afraid like the children of Israel? Or do you marvel at the love of a God with such power? The God of the universe has the power to snap his fingers and eliminate the earth with all its heartache and sin and degradation. But instead, as John 3.16 tells us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, and you talk about him on the, God on the mountaintop in the Sinai. Exodus 19.16 says, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings. <laughs> That's right, dog. God is an awesome God that we serve. He loves us more than anything. And for us to know that he has all that power and yet he chooses to love us. That should be something that inspires us to love others. Duh, no, Brother D. And, and here, here's my favorite. Here comes Pastor Brian with Battle with the Rangers, Chapter 12 in Spotted Boy and the Comanches. Here's Pastor Brian. Chapter 12, 
battle with the rangers. By the time the band of horse traders had reached the old village camp, it was mid-October, a year since Thad's kidnapping from home. After seeing with his own eyes how cruel his captors could be, he found it difficult to feel as friendly toward them as before. He tried to keep in mind what Johnny Ainsworth had said about hating Comanches. Comanches are living their lives as they have been raised to live them. But for the present, Thad was tired, and he missed the encouraging visits with Miss Sally Buchanan. He supposed everyone live, lived his life as he'd been taught to live it, but he did not like the way the Comanches had been taught to live theirs. Thad had one big worry. What had happened to Melissa in little bit? He could call to mind every incident of their escape, and he could hear again the hoofbeat, hoofbeats of little bit fading out toward the sunset, sunrise. Had they made it home? Where were they now? Would his brothers know where he was and come in search of him? Those questions went around and around in his brain. If anything had happened to Melissa, he felt it was his fault for getting her started on such a dangerous journey. The camp was soon on the move toward the north. As the days went by, he walked for hour after hour in the dust of the moving village, along with some Indian women and children. So many of the horses had been traded off that there were not enough for all to ride. Thad was generally too tired and cold and miserable to think of anything, even home or loved ones. He could not even hope or pray when night came. When he dropped with his smelly old robe wrapped around him, he immediately fell into a deep sleep. At evening, when the band stopped, Thad was dispatched to gather wood for the cook fires. Then he helped Little Rabbit set up Yellow Cloud's teepee. That mean, meant dragging the lodge poles from the sides of the poor, tired ponies and unrolling the heavy buffalo hide cover from the travois. Thad carried his robe strapped across his shoulders. It was his only possession. He sometimes worried about his appearance, imagining it to be that of a neglected, weather-beaten scarecrow. He thought of his ragged buckskin, his face streaked with dirt, his hair a thatch of dirty straw. He felt pretty sorry for himself at times. The fact was, he was beginning to feel like a Comanche youngster himself, and he disliked the idea. Finally, Yellow Cloud decided to give the village a chance to rest and find some meat. It became bitterly cold as the norther swept down across the plains and whistled around the camp all of one day and night. Thad thought longingly of the snug front room at home where the family gathered to sit out the northerners. They would crack pecans, play dominoes, and tell stories. He thought he would die of homesickness. One day a band of young hunters returned to camp leading ponies loaded with buffalo and antelope meat. The camp was full of noise and excitement as they came galloping in, with old women screaming, children shouting, and dogs barking. Anyone who thinks of Indians as a strong, silent type should visit a Comanche village when there is excitement afoot. But the hunters brought news that stirred up more excitement than the meat did. We saw long knives, two lances reported. The elders began to question him while Thad, Scarponi, and the other boys listened. How many long knives? Buffalo Horn wanted to know. Two lances held up his hands with fingers spread, dropped them, and raised them again until he had indicated thirty. Did you give them battle? 
Yellow Cloud asked. No, <laughs> they were too many. They had many guns and wanted to parley. We did not wish to battle. We were too few and we had come to hunt. For what did they wish to parley? Yellow Cloud asked. They were hunting buffalo as we were, two lances explained, but they wanted to ask us if we had seen a white boy and girl that, that Comanches took many moons ago. What did you tell them? We told them we knew of no white boy or girl in any Comanche camp. It suddenly struck Thad that he was the boy and Melissa was the girl the Long Knives were asking about. Then he realized what that meant. If the men were inquiring for both a boy and a girl, the Melissa and Little Bit had never reached home. They had had plenty of time, months. If they were not at home by this time, they were either dead or had been captured by some other band of Indians. Perhaps they had been captured by another tribe. Thad was more discouraged than ever. As they traveled each day toward Indian territory, and he realized that they were getting farther and farther from his home, he would awake in the night and cry. He even quit saying his prayers. One night another norther blew down on them, howling, screaming, and moaning, and bringing a bitter, piercing cold. Thad lay in his buffalo robe with his teeth chattering. The mournful wind seemed to him to be sorrowing for his loved ones. Perhaps the sorrow was for Melissa too, Thad thought. If she and Little Bit had not reached home, some terrible thing must have happened to them. Did they get lost? Did she die of exposure? Maybe some of Yellow Cloud's braves had killed her. But where, then, was Little Bit? If the people of this village had taken Little Bit again, they would have brought her back. But she had never appeared among the ponies of the herd since Melissa rode away on her. Scarpony had boasted that he would bring back his blackbird, but he had never done it. The morning after the norther struck, rain and sleet began. It whipped about the camp, drenching the people, even cutting their skin. The ponies huddled together with their tails to the wind. Thad was sure he would have died in that storm had he not been kept active fetching wood and helping feed the fires. At last the storm blew itself out. The sun came forth, shining on a white and frozen world. Thad was gathering wood early one morning when he heard pounding of hooves. A mounted brave splashed through the water a little way from him. He recognized the rider as Mad Raven, a member of a small hunting party that had gone in search of meat. A scout had located a small herd of buffalo only a few miles from the camp. Mad Raven's horse was lathered and bloody foam blew in flecks from his mouth. Something was up. What had the hunters run into? Thad hurried to gather his load of wood and started back to camp. He wondered if the hunters had run into white men again. He hoped fervently that they had. Scarpony, Running Fox, Boy Who Laughs, and Small Weasel joined Thad as he hurried toward Yellow Cloud's lodge. They would stay as near the council fire as they dared to listen to the news. They soon had the gist of it. Our braves fight with long knives, Running Fox said. The women and girls behind them broke into scornful laughter at this. A girl threw a stone that hit Thad in the back. Another ran up and spit at him. Thad paid no heed. Our braves kill many long knives, said Small Weasel boasted. White men run away. Thad was 
pretty sure Small Weasel knew as little as he did about it, so he tried a little boasting of his own. Why men do not run away, ever, he said. Scarponi said quietly, We have not heard what happened. We know only that there was a battle. Thad listened attentively as the story was told from the beginning. Medicine dog shot at a buffalo, Mad Raven was saying. He missed and fired two more times. Our other men shot arrows at the bull. I was a long way from where Medicine Dog was. The long knives heard the shots. They came on their horses running. The same white men you saw ten suns ago? Yellow Cloud asked. Mad Raven hesitated. I think maybe some are the same, he said. Were the white men settlers or rangers? I think some settlers, some rangers. Some rode all together like soldiers, only they do not have U.S. on their saddles like soldiers. He drew the letters in the sand. The old cloud nodded emphatically. They are rangers. How many do you think? Maybe ten settlers, thirty rangers? Yellow Cloud and other men made a chuckling noise, clucking noise with their tongues. We go help our hunters, Yellow Cloud snapped. At a sign from him, the braves hurried from the lodge to get their weapons. A few minutes later, they pounded out of the village on their horses, armed to the teeth and and striped and painted for battle. There were about 60 of them. Only Yellow Cloud and Buffalo Horn wore the war bonnets of eagle feathers. Yellow Clouds hung down to his horse's back. Thad was dazed. A few miles away were his own people. Maybe they were not his own brothers, but at least they were folk who might take him to his home. He tried to think. If he could only sneak away, he might be able to reach the white men. But Little Rabbit was one jump ahead of him. She seized him by the, so- by the shoulder and snapped at him. You, spotted boy, you no run away, you work. She set him to work, helping break camp, for they were getting ready tra- to travel again. Thad worked automatically while his mind went around and around. Over and over he prayed, Oh Lord, help our people to win. Yellow Cloud's teepee was the last in the village to come down. Thad was helping Little Rabbit roll the hide cover of it when the sounds of battle reached their ears. Far away shots, Indian yells, an occasional shout from the white men. Thad was bursting with excitement. Was his release at hand? Suddenly the sounds increased in volume. The beating of hoofs became louder as the warriors were driven back to the village. White men were yelling now, too. They're winning! They're winning! Our men are winning! Thad yelled in Comanche, jumping up and down. Suddenly he was seized from behind. A hand was clapped over his mouth and a cloth gag stuffed into it and fastened. His hands and feet were bound. He was pushed under a heap of buffalo robes that lay beside the pile of lodge poles in the rolled-up cover of Yellow Cloud's teepee. He fought and kicked, kicked against his fetters, but he was so tightly bound that he could scarcely move. He gagged over the wad of cloth and was unable to bring a sound from his throat. He finally concluded that the best thing to do was to lie still. Surely, he thought, if the white men took the village, they would look under every pile of robes. Then something plumped down upon him. It felt like a person sitting on the robes that covered him. He learned later that it was a very old woman who looked as though her rickety bones might fall apart 
any moment. The sounds of battle came nearer until they were in the village all around him. The firing ceased, but he could hear men's voices, white men's voices. He tried to yell to make some sort of noise, but it was no use. He thought, they are searching the village. Surely they will find me. He wondered if Reed or Giles or Mr. Johnny Ainsworth were among them. He lost consciousness, then from lack of air. The next thing he knew, he was being hauled roughly from the heap of robes. The Comanches had relied on the mercy of the white men not to disturb an apparently sick old woman. The Comanches had never been known to spare anyone because of age or helplessness in their raids on the whites. But they knew the white men were different. They had taken advantage of this to keep Thad a prisoner. As the boy gradually returned to his sentences, everything in the village was in tumult. Wailing for the dead had begun. Heaps of family possessions were scattered, and women and children were gathering them together. Thad knew that the white men had turned them over in their search for him. Many of their horses had been shot or driven away. A feeling of bitter, bitter sorrow was in the air. Thad wondered how the defeat of his captors would affect their treatment of him. Since his attempted escape, he had been treated with a measure of respect and friendliness, for the Indians admired a person with spunk and courage. This was one of the saddest days of the boy's captivity. That morning, he had believed himself in the hands of friends. Now he found himself in the most serious danger of his life. As he sat on the ground trying to recover from near suffocation, he was kicked by almost every villager, man or woman, who passed by. The children hissed at him, and the boys and girls of his own age spit upon him, all but Scarpony, Boy Who Laughs, and Running Fox. They stayed away. He was sore at heart and broken in spirit. As the days passed, the villagers disposed of their dead with mourning and wailing. Thad tried to tell himself, serves them right, but somehow he felt himself grieving with them. He had known several of the young warriors who had been killed in battle, and he was sorry about them. He could not find it in his heart to hate them now, regardless of what they had done to him. Eight of the warriors had been killed, and a number of horses had been driven away. The horses that remained were loaded to the limit, to Thad, and to every woman and girl an extra burden was given to carry. Travel was slow, and the skies were gray as they neared their destination. A steady drizzle fell. Scarpony often walked beside Thad. Scarpony seemed to sense Thad's keen disappointment and sympathized with him. He said, Maybe you find your people when we get to the agency. Thad had no idea what the agency was like. Where is the agency, he asked. Where we are going, Scarpony answered. It is in Indian territory, not far from Fort Still. Thad had often heard of Fort Still and of Indian territory, but he knew little about them, nor did he know anything of the location of Fort Still. It did comfort him to have Scarpony show himself friendly. Thad was sick the last few days of their journey. He had pneumonia, and no wonder, after the exposure of the past few weeks, his chest hurt, his head ached, and he burned with fever. It seemed as though each time he coughed, something tore loose inside him. The thought of food gagged him. Little rabbits 
put an old woolen shirt on him. Some poor settler had doubtless yielded his life with that shirt, but the boy was too ill to think of that. It does not occur to Thad to wonder why she should show so much interest in his getting well. Looking back, after many years, he came to believe that Little Rabbit was attached to him with a motherly sort of affection. He knew she had lost two sons in battle, one against the white soldiers and one against the Apaches in New Mexico. As Thad stumbled along, Scarpony took his hand and placed it on his own shoulder. Tears glittered in his dark eyes as he looked at the white boy. Lean on me, he said. Scarpony is your friend. A warm surge of gratitude and even love swept through, through Thad. He knew he would never forget Scarpony's kindness. That night, Little Rabbit covered Thad with robes until he was weighted down. He was so hot beneath them that he thought he could not bear it. But during the, the night, Little Rabbit came now and then to tuck the covers about him. Just about daylight, just before daylight, he broke into a profess, profuse sweat. It left him weak, but his fever seemed to be broken. Little Rabbit doused him with a bucket of cold water. It took his breath, but then she rubbed him briskly with a scrap of dry hide until he tingled with warmth again. It was a drastic treatment, but it seemed to work. He felt better than he had for a long time, although he was still weak and shaking. Little Rabbit brought him a bowl of steaming broth. Drink, she ordered. The broth of antelope will make you strong. The heat will warm you. Thad was as hungry as a mother wolf now. His ribs stuck out almost like barrel staves, and he shook so that he could hardly hold the cup. But the hot brew seemed to pour warmth and strength into him. Scarpony walked beside him again that last day and made him lean on his shoulder. Little Rabbit and Blue Flower could not do enough for him. Even Yellow Cloud came to feel, feel his bones and mother, mutter something about meatless ribs. Thad was beginning to feel affection towards these enemy, enemies of his people. Scarpony and Little Rabbit had made his lot as easy as they were able, especially in these last weeks. People of the village, he thought, might be compared to an assortment of white people. Some were good, some cruel, some indifferent. He kept remembering Mr. Johnny's words. They live as they have been raised to live. He let that speak for itself. Duh, we want to thank Pastor Brian for all the stories that he's been doing for us and everything. And, and he, he says thank you all for the prayers and everything. He He's on the mend and he's getting better, but he still needs your prayers. That's right, dog. And we need to look at the time. Duh, oh, man. Is it time to go already, Brother D? That's right, dog. It's time to go. Let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our many blessings. We are grateful for all that we've been given. Father, once again, we lift up the firefighters, the EMTs, the doctors, the nurses, the law enforcement officers, those first responders who serve and protect us. Father, we lift up our armed forces, the ones who keep us safe so that we may worship you as we see fit. Father, we have many friends and family that are sick and ill. We ask you to reach out. If it be thy will, touch them with your healing hand. Father, we ask that you be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Father, we are grateful for all that you have given us. We've been blessed beyond all measure. And for that, we are truly grateful. And pray in our Lord and Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
The folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks, or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. Again, that is emtx3xl at gmail.com. Folks, we'd like to remind you, WGFW is a Christian radio station, and it needs your support. You hear no advertising on this radio station because you are the supporters. You are the ones that keep it going. So please send your donations to the, the don't use the station call letters, brother D. That's right, dog. Send you. Send your donations, folks, to God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Again, that's God's Final Call and Warning, P.O. Box 361, Chatham, Virginia, 24531. Uh, Folks, we want to thank everybody. Uh, You heard us talking last week, five years on the radio, but we actually got to look at you. We've been on the radio six years, and we want to thank Safe Haven Ministries, who's been our sponsor for the last couple of years and everything. But we really want to thank all you all who've kept us on the air. That's right, folks. And if you've missed any of the episodes that we've managed to record and everything, or if you want to hear some of the children's stories that we do on the YouTube channel, please use the... Phone number you heard, 434-390-5981. You can text message us or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. And we will send you the link to the YouTube channel. Once again, folks, we like to remind everybody that today is a very special day in the fact that we had to leap forward. Remember, daylight savings time has started. So, when you hear me announce the time, don't be thinking what's going on. Remember, we leaped one hour ahead. Duh, yep, that was in honor of Brother D's birthday. Y'all lost an hour of sleep just because it's his birthday. They did not, dog. It is daylight savings time. Once again, folks, this is WGFW 88.7 on your FM dial. Drake's Branch, Virginia. The time is... 947, we return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, folks, may your week be blessed.